thanks for tuning in this evening and uh, welcome to tonight's event. Um, for those of you that, uh, that don't know me, uh, my name is Barry Cranford. I'm the, uh, I'm the founder of the, uh, the LJC. Um, I'm not a developer myself, as many of you will know. Uh, I am a, uh, a recruiter, or at least I run a, a recruitment company called, uh, called RecWorks. Um, so what am I doing here? Um, well, firstly, I'm a, a big fan of, of mentoring uh, and, and learning. Um, I personally was, uh, was lucky enough to have met a few uh, fairly inspirational mentors earlier in, in my career that, that, that really helped me get a, a head start. Um, but I've learned a lot from, from my time in recruitment. Working in recruitment is pretty cool. You get to see, uh, you get to see other people's careers and, and watch how, how various people kind of seem to rise straight to the top and, 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 and faster than, than some other people. Um, and what I started noticing was it, it often came down to, to chance. It often came down to, to who people met. Uh, so just like myself, seeing that certain people met different mentors at different times and, and careers went very, very quickly. Um, so when we've, we've built RecWorks, this company, we've, we've built it around similar kind of principles, trying to, to really encourage people to, to get ahead and, and, and meet the right people, hear from the right people as, as much as they can. Um, it's really what, what we're trying to do is, is make recruitment a, a real force of good in, in the industry. Um, so a lot of the work that, that we do sits somewhere between paying back to the industry and, and or giving back and, and paying it forward. Um, so a few examples we've run, uh, I think we've run over, over 600 events now. Um, we've made over 2000 uh, personal introductions through the Meet a Mentor uh, community that we've got. We've launched careers of, of quite a few uh, speakers um, that have gone on to do conferences and, and we're hungry to, to launch more. We've got a lightning talks event on Friday. So please, please come on and, uh, and, and have a chat on that. Um, but we're really only, only able to do all this because of the revenue that comes from, from recruitment, from the relationships that we make and the people that obviously we work with there. So if you're looking for work, if you're looking to, um, uh, to hire some developers, then please do, do give us a shout. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm going to get out of the way. I'm going to uh, hand over to Richard Warburton, who's going to be, um, who's going to be taking it on from here. Uh, so for those of you that don't know Richard, he's the CTO and co-founder of Opsian. Uh, which is a cutting-edge performance tooling company. Uh, he's also the lead developer of the high-performance uh, RTO Fix engine, uh, and he's also a plural site trainer, a best-selling book author, a conference speaker, PhD, a Londoner. Richard, should I go on, or are you? Uh, that's, I think that covers things pretty well. Thanks, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, hand over to yourself then. I hope everyone uh, enjoys the rest of the evening with Richard. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction, Barry. That's lovely. Uh, yeah, so my name is Richard Warburton. Um, I'm giving this talk called uh, Fantastic Performance and Where to Find It. So in this talk, we're going to cover a number of different topics. Uh, firstly, we're going to talk by what, what do I actually mean by fantastic performance and where to find it and stuff like that. Um, and then I'm going to go through a few kind of profiling examples. So we've got some code. Uh, I'm going to find some bottlenecks in that code. And fix that bottleneck, uh, find the bottleneck using profiling, fix it and iterate a little bit. Then we're going to talk about uh, how those kind of synthetic examples of profiling on uh, my desktop doing this presentation map to real world problem solving for actual production environments. And then we're going to kind of wrap the threads up and, and conclude at the end. So firstly, you know, the talk title said fantastic performance. What does fantastic performance actually mean? Um, for me, fantastic performance is very simple. It actually means the application is meeting the business goals that it has set out for performance. Now, that might seem like a very low bar. You know, in London, uh, there's a lot of people working in finance, doing things like low latency trading systems, capital markets, people building out exchanges, all sorts of things like that. But um, you know, some of those use cases can be a little bit esoteric, as can, for example, people doing ad tech, uh, as can people who are doing, for example, scientific high performance computing. Those use cases all exist. They're all really important. They all have high performance bars, but they're not the only people out there. You know, anyone running a website has a situation where they have potential uh, performance issues and things that can make the users unhappy, things where they can get uh, better uh, business activity from having a satisfying experience in a fast system um, out there. So for me, that's why I say it's fantastic performance, because you can just see how many systems out there are frustratingly slow in some way and just not fantastic at all. And we want, we want more things to be fantastic. 
Now, I, you know, pre-lockdown, it's all a bit different with lockdown now, but pre-lockdown, I used to go to a lot of conferences, a lot of meetups, and you listen to p different um, talks that people give at these events. And a lot of them, when they talk about performance, they talk about architecture, they talk about these big picture, grand visions that they've got lying around in, in, their, own, in their own system. Uh, and you get all the, the relevant performance-related buzzwords, reactive, asynchronous web scale and people are immediately jumping on bandwagon in order to provide architectural solutions you must rewrite your system you must move to microservices you must adopt a NoSQL database i'm not necessarily anti those kind of architectural ideas i'm not saying they're bad necessarily a lot of these decisions and technology and choices have the right place in the right environment but they're not really what this talk is about. This talk is about a more scientific view on performance, a more methodological view on performance. Um, some people think, you know, performance is a matter of getting the right magic incantation that you can just say. You just use this tech or this tool or something and everything's magically fast. But actually for me, I found <coughs> performance as a methodology is something that we can think more about when we're software developers, about looking at our systems, thinking about them scientifically, thinking about them meth methodically, thinking about what we can measure and understand from that production system. We can use those measurements to narrow down to causes and problems within the performance of our system and iterate and improve on that performance. And that's what I wanna talk about today. Simple, low-hanging fruit that everyone can find in their own applications. Because, you know, at Opsy, we've also done a number of consulting engagements with clients and we sometimes find that just a simple uh, application of these kind of approaches and methodologies can rapidly get people easy 10x throughput wins and, and sort of things like that. Okay so enough of the introduction let's talk about some actual profiling because that's what most of this talk is going to be about. It's going to be about kind of profiling and measurement to find performance problems. So what does profiling actually do? Well it tells us what the the main consumer of a resource is, the dominant consumer of a resource is. It tells us what is bottlenecking our system. So that resource could be CPU time, it could be war clock time, it could be um, memory consumption, memory allocation rates, all sorts of things. And when I say find the dominant consumer, I mean point to a part of our application stack, the line of code, the method, whatever, that is telling you where that resource is used up. But there's the other aspect of it, the more philosophical aspect of it. What are we actually doing here uh, with profiling? Well, I like to think of it that we're challenging our mental model of how our software is operating with actual data. We all write code, we all write software, and we build a mental model of how that software works, an abstraction that sits in our head, not in, uh, in, in classes and interfaces and things. And that mental model, uh, when it diverges from reality, that's when we get bugs. We think things work one way, in practice they actually work another way. And that's often how we have uh, performance problems as well. We think things work one way in our mental model and in reality they work another way. Um, and profiling data provides us concrete data that we can use to challenge that mental model and find what the, the real truth is like a scientist would. Now, I'm going to give you some profiling examples here, but I wouldn't necessarily say if we've got a performance problem that a profiling data is the first piece of data that you want to get. It's, um, it helps you achieve a diagnosis for a problem, but it's not the only diagnostic. Uh, so one of the other things we can look at before profiling is basic CPU time data or concrete metrics from the system uh, that we're uh, looking at that will help us find the bottleneck that we're interested in solving. Now, I've given an example here of getting CPU metrics out with VMstat. I mentioned VMstat because it's super, super old school. It's installed everywhere. You can even get it on Solaris if you, if you want, if, you're, if there's anyone old school enough here to be running Solaris. Uh, but you can also get it on pretty much any Linux distro. The, nowadays, ideally, um, you know, you would be using a uh, modern metrics collection and graphing system to get these kind of CPU numbers in. But 
are, you know, the, the key point is that you're able to get that data and understand what it's doing. Metrics like this can be really super useful. Just looking at that CPU column on the right hand side, we've got five different columns there within it, and they're cryptically named us, Sai, Id, Wa, and Stu, right? So what are those metrics actually saying? Well, us is user time. That's time on your CPU that's being spent by actual application code executing. Sai is system time. That's time spent in the operating system's kernel that's eating CPU time. Id, idle, that's CPU time that's just not being used. Wa, wait your cpu is sitting there waiting for an io operation to complete and still steal your cpu is having its some of its cycle stolen by another virtual machine running on the same cpu somewhere uh, uh so virtual on some conceptual level so it could be something on a different hypervisor something like that now when looking at these different things, you know, you can narrow down these things. If you've got huge amounts of steal time, which is something that you can sometimes see on like modern cloud environments, if you're using those little micro instances or really small uh, cloud-based VM instances, you sometimes get high steal time. And that's when you've got a noisy neighbor problem. And it doesn't really matter how good your code is. If your CPU time is all being stolen by another virtualized instance on, on the same host, you should just kill it and start up your system on a new host. That's what people like Netflix do. Similarly, if your user time is sitting at 100% of CPU, there's no, point in there's no point in trying to make uh, your parallel system use more CPU. You're already using the CPU there. You need to think about efficiency. So key point there is understanding where your bottlenecks do you want to enhance parallelism? Do you want to, are you bottlenecked in user code, system code, waiting on disk IO, all sorts of things. So I'm going to next have a look at some example problems. And the example problems, they're open source. It's just a GitHub repo with a few performance problems in. There's the link there in the slides. I'll, I'll share the slides afterwards. Um, I'll get them sent out to anyone with the Eventbrite link. Um, and you know, feel free to clone that repo on GitHub and try and play around with this stuff at home yourself afterwards. So firstly, let's look at a CPU bottleneck system. So this is a system where, let's pretend I've looked at the metrics established that's quite CPU bottleneck. And um, uh, what have we got going on here? So let's call that demo one. I've got a simple, little uh, drop wizard application that I've put together here in the background. It's going to start up and uh, run. And I've got a uh, script here that I'm going to use. I'm just going to show you some of the output. So what I've done is I've downloaded the data of house price transactions in the UK, which you can get, just get from the government's website. And I've built a little endpoint that searches those house price transactions and gives you the result of um, a certain query string. So here I'm going to just hit that endpoint to give you an example of what the output is, format it with jQuery, and I'm going to do a search for Cardiff um, because that's where I'm from. And I've sorted these, they're sorted by price. So the cheapest price transaction on some kind of real estate purchase was £266, which sounds super cheap. You might think Wales, yeah, it's pretty cheap. But obviously the most expensive is way more expensive than that, £29 million of price. And uh, you can see the street, the town, the city, the district, all sorts of stuff within this data. So uh, that's... Fair enough, that's an example of what the kind of thing that this uh, endpoint would output. And I've actually uh, got a house search script here. Um, and I'm gonna run that in the background. So what's that script doing? Well, it's running AB, which is the Apache Bench, HTTP benchmarking framework. Dash C4 here means run it with four different threads concurrently dash n and the argument is like the number of requests I'm going to hit an endpoint with. Only a couple of hundred here because this initially takes absolutely ages. So if I gave you 10,000 or something, it would take, it would be here all day waiting for this benchmark to complete. 
Um, this is not aiming to be a super perfect, scientifically rigorous benchmark, just a load harness that we can use to see and understand some problems. And the output from this benchmarking code here is in the form of a latency histogram. So looking at this code here, what does this mean? Half of the requests are responded to in about 600 milliseconds or less in terms of time. The worst case is 100 is 1.7 seconds and the 99th percentile is 860 milliseconds. So let's suppose we decide that that is too slow for us. Um, I am going to uh, log in to um, Opsin, which I've hooked this up to. So that is a um, always on production profiler. And I'm going to do a bit of digging here. So what I've done is I've done a search for the profiling data related to the run we've just had. And this is a flame graph that we see on screen. So uh, a flame graph is a visualization of how that of, of that profiling data. So each box within a flame graph corresponds to one method within your application. And flame graphs can go top down or they can go bottom up. In this top down view, methods higher up call methods further down. So if I just zoom in to the flame graph so you can more easily see what's going on. The top method in our flame graph is javalang thread dot run. And then we see immediately under there, it jumps down to calling into some jetty code. Now, within flame graphs, I said each method was a box. The width of the box tells you how much time that method or its children, well, and all of its children take up. So if we see a flame graph where we get all boxes like this, where they're the same width, it doesn't matter um, what the name of these methods are, they aren't really using up much time themselves. It's not a very interesting part of the flame graph. What we want to look at is this bit at the bottom, okay? Um, and uh, this bit at the bottom is where the flame graph narrows down and we see different methods coming in. So uh, let's jump back into our code here and see what we have. Well, the first method that is uh, back into application code rather than framework code is this house research dot sales search. Then that calls the sales query dot search method. And then we spend below that nearly all of the time doing that search, calling this get sales data method and a little bit of time below that calling read sales. That immediately looks like a red flag to me if I'm looking at this code. The fact that 77% of our time is spent calling a getter Surely getters should just be returning a reference. What is going on here? Well, um, if I show you firstly this house research, so this is the drop wizard endpoint for our sales search query with the string we provided there, so that'd be Cardiff. I then call search and I've got to get all that sales data. I'm going to use the streams framework here from Java 8 to query the data. So we're doing a filter with a big lambda, looking at the county, the district, the locality. These are like lines of the address, primary addressable object name, secondary addressable object name. And this code also sorts the sales by price. That's why when we looked at that data for Cardiff earlier, the cheapest one was at the top and the most expensive one was at the bottom. Okay, we actually said this getter, get sales data, was using up most of the time. So what the heck is that doing? Shouldn't get us just return a reference to return a field value? Well, it does return a field value, but it also lazily initializes this data. So it goes, if that sales data is null, return the sales data so it's not been initialized. And it's kind of, if you just read this code and read through it, you'll realize that this read sales method, it returns a list of house sales, but it hasn't actually initialized this field here. It's never assigned to. So how about we assign the read sales value into that sales data method? Now, potentially this method could be called from different threads. So I'm gonna synchronize it. So the first time it's run, we might get different threads uh, contending on uh, the method, but after it's initialized, it should be nice and cheap and return really fast. So what I'm gonna do here is rebuild and rerun 
uh, the build script and start up this web service again on my local machine, having made that fix in the IDE. Um, and here we go, Drop Wizard is back up, and I'm gonna rerun this house search script. Now, last time we saw it took 600 milliseconds. Now it's only taken 64 milliseconds at the 50th percentile. Um, the worst case is still pretty much the same because the worst case is, you know, the first couple of requests that have to load that data. But if we really care about those, we can also think about uh, preloading the data or prefetching the data. Okay, just run this again, just to make sure it's not that fast by fluke. And yeah, we still get things which are about 10 times faster than before. Okay, so let's suppose that that isn't quite uh, fast enough for us. Um, and uh, this time I ran my agent ID of demo two. So let's move forward in terms of time. So for uh, demo two, I'm gonna narrow the thread pool down to just the application thread pool because we're getting a bit of startup time here. So for demo two, this is our post optimization data for profiling. So I found the problem, fixed it, and I'm just re-evaluating this profiling data to see what the change was. If we zoom back in here to see what's going on with our sales search method, that's still the big consumer of time. But previously, when we did sales query.search, that was calling our getter, and our getter was eating up loads of time. And now we have javautilstream.referencepipeline.collect. Very interesting. So now we're into the streams framework, which if you remember is the code we saw earlier where we we're doing that querying. Now I know what you're sitting there thinking, Richard, streams is slow, don't use streams, use for loops. Okay, well, maybe streams are the problem, maybe they aren't the problem. Let's have a look at what our data here tells us. And actually, uh, we can even see it from the, the pattern of the flame graph overall, where the width of these boxes is pretty much the same all the way down through our stream code. And in fact, we get back into this lambda method, the sales query search method lambda, and we get a load of time spent in our contains ignore case method in sales query. And in fact, we can see that that has a couple of different things. Firstly, there's Java lang string dot contains. And secondly, there's two uppercase. So clearly two uppercase is a real slow uh, bottlenecky problem here. So let's go back in our code uh, to the sales query method. Um, and we can see in the sales query method, we've got the contains ignore case method. And the way this contains in all case method is implemented, pretty slapdash coding by me, I guess, when I wrote it. We uppercase the field, we uppercase the query string, and then we call contains on those two values. Well, okay. There are different ways that you can implement this algorithmically, uh, but actually we also have some libraries here. So, um, we, there's a string utils class in the Apache Commons uh, framework, and that in fact has a convenient contains ignore case method built in. So we can try that on the field and the query string and rebuild and rerun this code and see what happens. Hopefully, the Apache common stuff is faster than just calling to uppercase on both the strings and then calling contains on them, right? We were at 63 milliseconds before. Now we're down to 44. Just run that again, just to check we're not getting flukes. 44 again, very similar. So we are a little bit faster this time than we were before. What does our profiling data um, tell us? Well, if we look at uh, demo three this time around, we've got another big flame graph, similar overall pattern, similar overall structure. And I'm gonna zoom back in so you can see the methods more easily at the bottom because it's a very big flame graph. Again, we've got contains ignore case, uses up most of the time. And 
it's just delegating to string utils dot contains ignore case. So what's going on here? Well, we established that code is about is about twenty five percent faster than last time around, but but we're still fundamentally doing the same thing here. So even though the string utils class has a much faster contains ignore case it hasn't actually improved things that much. And this is sometimes what you get uh, as you optimize code. You, opt you find a bottleneck, you optimize the bottleneck, it's faster, that's good, but it's still the main bottleneck. So we need to find a way of optimizing this a little bit further. And in fact, what I'm going to do this time round is use a little bit of domain knowledge in my application here. So um, what, the data would tell us if we looked at that CSV file and that and those those data strings is that actually the raw data for these fields for the county, the district, the locality and all is uppercase to begin with. And so what we can actually do is create a query string and just uppercase the input once. And we can just call contains here as well. Now that might seem like it's cheating a little bit, but what we've really done here is we've taken some domain knowledge about the way our available data is, we've found a pattern in that data, and we've simplified it. Another approach could be on startup to just uppercase all those strings anyway, so that we know we can consistently uh, create a lowercase version of them. And if I run this benchmark again, we can see there are 20 milliseconds, 18 milliseconds. So we're now looking at something that is running 20 times faster than it was on our first run. So that is, sorry, 30 times faster than it was on our first run. So that is a nice improvement for our CPU bottleneck. But often when people are looking at profiling data, they see that CPU bottlenecks are the kind of things that they can find with profilers, but they're not the only kind of bottlenecks that you see in your application. Um, you might see problems that are related to um, external services, to databases, to locks, things like that. Things where it's not the CPU that's hitting 100%. Talk about the metrics we saw earlier. If your metrics tell you your performance bottleneck is not using too much CPU, it may be that you've got a blocking related problem here or a locking related problem. I'm going to give you a demo of uh, one of those problems here with our application. Um, and my demo application is. Uh, going to be talking to a legacy bank service. So the idea here is I've got a bunch of data in a legacy bank service and I'm migrating that data over into a new system and I'm just doing a quick performance test to see how long it'll take to run that migration. Um, and I want to try and run it as fast as is possible. And if I have a look at my bank class, we can see what the code in the bank class is doing for this migration. Um, we call this method legacy bank proxy dot get bank balance with the person ID for the, uh, the, the customer's ID for the customer we're gonna migrate. And what that does, it's gonna do an HTTP get, a request of some data from that external service. We look up the person DAO object uh, for that person ID. We deposit the money in their bank and then we persist that and save it into the database. Maybe the thing that's going to be slow here is talking to the external service. Maybe it's going to be the database. Who knows? That's what it looks like we're doing. So um, let's uh, catch that merge script so I can explain it and then I'll leave it running. So this merge script again is using AB to run a little load harness here. Um, it's doing a post to try and force this merge accounts operation. Uh, but we're going to run it in parallel with four different user IDs and, and uh, see how that works. And uh, I'm just going to search for the amount of time taken for these different operations at the end. And it took us 27 seconds for a few users. So that's quite slow. 
Um, that is time. Sorry, I wanted to run this with a different demo number here so I can quickly filter uh, uh, the results there afterwards. So let me restart it with that demo and then rerun that. Oh, hasn't started yet. And then rerun that merge account script. Uh, it still wouldn't take us, you know, 27, 28 seconds, uh, something like that, in order to get the, uh, the data there. Um, the service that we have in the background is also running on my uh, machine here. I'm just running in an IDE. It, the legacy bank service in the case of this project is very simple. It just has an artificial kind of fake pause in it to make sure the operation runs slowly. There we see it uses 28 seconds. Um, and we'll be able to see what's going on with that system. So if I just quickly uh, look up the latest demo five numbers, you know, if we look at what this system is doing, I mean, I can actually even remove, this is a thread pool filter, so we can even see what's going on here. We don't have many CPU samples in this profile. And actually, if I zoom in here to the top, we can see 78% of the CPU samples I've got, 78% of the CPU time is actually in the startup operation of this system. So this would indicate when you see weird profiles like this, the CPU profiling data is not that useful in and of itself. And actually, if I went and looked at the metrics of what the box was doing, this process wouldn't be taking up much CPU time at all. And that is when wall clock profiling comes into play. So wall clock profiling is a type of profiling where, as opposed to trying to find the amount of time where you're sitting on CPU, actually burning your core really nice and fast, Wall clock time is the beginning to end time of the operation that you're engaging in here. So I'm going to uh, run that wall clock profiler. Um, and this is telling us methods which are actually sitting there taking time. And, and this will include time when we're blocking and paused. Now, the biggest thing I see here is this socket channel impl.accept. So that's the system waiting around for new connections a lot. Fair enough. But this stuff here looks a lot more exciting. So I'm just gonna zoom into this, this, this subsection here where we're actually doing things. And we can see that this is where our merge method happens. So we've got our bank.merge balance from legacy account method. That was the method that we saw earlier in our code. We might think that we're gonna spend a lot of time talking to external services. That's the legacy bank proxy dot get bank balance method that does the HTTP get from the other service. But actually, if we zoom back out again, we can see this flame graph narrowing down at this point. Okay, so 100% um, within the merging method, only 30 within the get bank balance method. And that's when we see a lot of self time within method. So self time is when it's the method itself that is taking up uh, the time. So what could be taking up that self time? Well, it can't be calling any of these methods because those methods are, um, if, if time is being taken up in those methods, you would see that within the profile, you'd see those methods appear. So what is this actually doing? It's just taking number and, and calling it. The only other thing it does is it synchronizes on transfer lock at the beginning, okay? And if we look at that lock here, that is just a single object. It's one big global lock. So we have different threads that are operating here. They're all synchronizing on one big global lock. Most of them are sitting around waiting to get that lock. It's a lock contention problem. And I actually have a conveniently written method here called get lock uh, that basically has a lock for every user in our system. And you uh, synchronize on the per customer lock rather than the one big global lock. And the result of that approach is that it will reduce the contention because you'll be able to run different users updating their bank balance at the same time. If you were transferring money between different users, that would be a little bit tricky. You'd have to acquire the lock for both of those users in some kind of sensible way. Uh, but 
we'll see in our case we're just updating balances for an individual user so we'll see what our merge accounts method does this time round and we get down to 15 seconds so that's a big improvement that is you know uh roughly twice as fast as our example was before um, and if we take a look at the new profiling data from demo six and zoom in, we can see a very different profile here. Before we had a load of self time inside this merge balance from legacy bank account method. Now it's disappeared. Our get bank balance talking to the external service is eating all of the time up from that merging operation. Okay, so what is that HTTP request? bottlenecked on? Well, we can see that there's pretty much no self time in any of the methods until we get to the bottom of the profile. And the bottom of the profile is this method here, socket input stream dot socket read zero. What is that? That's actually the native code method that bootstraps our uh, Java's socket input stream class. So this is doing a read on an underlying network socket that's part of the HTTP get. So you're actually waiting for a network operation to uh, complete. And this is something that you see a lot with sort of microservices operations if you profile them. You'll look for something that's an external system. That external system could be another service, it could be a database, something like that. And you can look through the profiling data to see what the last method in your code was. So that is um, get bank balance was the last method in our code that will tell you what the different operation was that initiated this network call. What was it waiting on? And here it was an HTTP get. Now, in a real system, what you would have to do is fix that other service is fix that other service that is running in the background. Hang on, I'm going to have to stop the screen share a sec here because I think that it has stolen IntelliJ's ability to uh, modify things, right? I'm going to restart the screen share again now. Okay, um, so that is what I've done there whilst I stopped the screen share was I modified uh, this uh, uh, external system that I'm running. And I've modified it in a way that uh, removes a pause that was happening within that external system. So if it was a real world example, you'd have to go off and apply this same kind of methodology to that other service tune that and fix that. Here, it's just a demo. So I've just made things way faster by just switching off the bit of code there that was sleeping. Um, maybe the service wasn't your own service. Maybe it was a different team. If it was a different team, obviously, you'd have to talk to them, figure out what was going on. But at least you have the data there from your profiler that you could use to show them and see it's really this, which is the bottleneck within uh, the system that we're, we're talking about here. Okay, so that's an example of finding and fixing kind of wall clock or blocking related problems with profilers. Now, the things I've shown you here about running little benchmarks on my desktop, how do we translate from these kind of synthetic benchmarks and synthetic problems into solving real problems in a real system in the real world? Well, I'm going to go through a series of different problems here and explain how you, how you solve them. The first problem is being representative. So my synthetic benchmarks here were just simple Apache bench scripts that were just hitting an endpoint repeatedly. That's not how real users behave on a real system. They have different patterns of usage. Those patterns of usage can affect things like caching um, and they can make doing different operations concurrently can slow down some of those operations uh, by making your your cache both on the application and the CPU level, less efficient and less effective. Sometimes 
problems don't occur when you have a steady state of throughput traffic, but when you have a burst of specific traffic going on, hitting a specific set of endpoints. So problem one is being representative in terms of workload. The next part of being representative is being representative in terms of hardware. Your uh, development environment is usually not the same hardware as your production system runs on. Beefy uh, server-side uh, systems can um, uh, uh, have many more cores than a development environment, and that can often mean that certain things like lock contention problems don't become big problems on a laptop with two cores, but become a real big problem on a 64 core server. Often you can find the, the ratio of disk to CPU speed differs. And in fact, with more modern cloud-based environments, if you use those small micro instances, they can actually often be slower than a developer's machine. So it's not always the case that your work, that your work laptop is is slower than your work server. Finally, you've got to be representative in terms of the software stack that you're running. Many people develop on Mac OS or Windows and they run on Linux in a production system. And Linux and Mac OS and Windows have different schedulers, they do have different IO subsystems, they have very different behavior in many of these environments. Sometimes even different versions of the same OS can perform very, very differently. So whilst Java is very good at letting us write code that will run anywhere, it doesn't mean that it will run with the same speed on these different systems, okay? So something to be aware of. And that can also change where the bottleneck is in your different system on, on Linux versus Windows. Linux, I you know, run a lot of different code here and it, it tends to do a lot better on some IO operations than Windows does. The solution to these problems is do your measurement and your profiling on a real production system. By measuring in production, you are using your real system, your real data, and your customer's real workload. You're measuring what the actual problem is, and it saves you the step and the hassle of having to try and replicate that production performance problem with a load test or on a synthetic environment. It's really, it, it saves you so much time. And in practice, writing good load tests is a really difficult skill and it's so difficult I think many people just don't really do it properly or don't do it at all because it takes so, so long to get right. In order to measure that code in production properly you need low enough overhead profilers in order to actually be able to run that, those profiles in, on a production system without slowing the system down itself and as well as Opsian, so that's the company uh, that I co-founded and I helped run. We have a continuous profiler that has very, very low overhead, 1% or less for production usage. There are a bunch of open source ad hoc profilers that you can use and you can just connect up to a production system like Async Profiler, Honest Profiler on GitHub or Flight Recorder that comes with the JDK and is open source as of Java 11 or later. Problem two, intermittent issues. So often you get performance problems that aren't continuous, they're just a little burst. Maybe they happen rarely, like weekly, monthly, or annually, but you know when they happen, they're really, um, they are really, really bad problems that you need to fix. Or they could be related to timing issues, certain times of the day have problems. The solution to that kind of problem is continuous profiling. So you just always profile your production system, you retain the historical data, and that enables comparison. So it means you don't have to worry if you get these one-off performance hiccups here and there. Oh, I, I need to attach my profile or I need to connect into a production system. I need to figure out how to do that under stress, under pressure, before I run out of time. Don't worry about it. If you get very, very low overhead profilers, we can just run this stuff all the time, capture that historical data, and then just look at a time window of that historical data in order to find when the problem happened. Problem three, infrequently used code. So traditional profiling approaches require that benchmark code to really dominate the workload. So you have to be doing the same thing again and again and again and again and again. Production systems often have performance problems in valuable but infrequently used code. So customer signups are a good case. Usually customer signup processes 
need to be smooth, they need to be fast. And if you don't have a nice smooth and fast customer sign-up process, then it's gonna be difficult for you to acquire new customers and the business isn't gonna go anywhere. But usually those aren't taking up much time within your system because your sys users actually using your system is the bottleneck. So how do we deal with that? Traditional profilers, these things would be very small bits of time, so it would be very hard to spot within the noise of your profiling system. And the solution to that kind of problem is having ability to query, slice, and dice the profiling data. So that means being able to filter profiles specifically, not just by thread or by system, but by method names and things like that. When you get the ability to just query, you know, find me profiling data where, you know, customer endpoint class would be used, you can very, very rapidly narrow down on those infrequently seen bottleneck scenarios. With continuous profiling, you've got enough data. Uh, with sampling profiles, it's just about the number of samples you have of the code that you're trying to profile. It's not about having them those samples collected quickly. You can just continuously profile, do the filtering, and you get that data out of it. Very, very, very useful. Finally, problems four and five, access and scale. Now, I've got the Great Wall of China here as a symbolic Chinese wall. Many people have Chinese walls within their organization that stop developers from having access to production systems. So those ad hoc profiles that we talked about earlier, you can't just hook them up to a production system, connect in and profile. It's not very practical. A Chinese wall, Great Wall of China rather, is also very large um, and that's symbolic of the scale problems that people have so uh, how are you going to go and connect in with these ad hoc profilers to hundreds or thousands of, of service and the solution to those problems is about decoupling visualization from profiling having agents that capture that data within a production environment ship it back to an aggregation service like a monitoring setup would do and then have web reports in a UI that let you see that profiling data. This is an order of magnitude more practical when you're doing production profiling. Okay, so uh, let's wrap up what we've talked about. First, I have to say thanks to loads of people who've done great work on improving the quality of profiling in Java and JVM over the years. Those flame graphs we saw, saw earlier, they were by Brendan Gregg, fantastic ideas there, uh, Netflix performance wizard. Um, Andre Pangin uh, and Jeremy Manson have both done great work on asynchronous low overhead profiles on the JVM, same with uh, Johannes Rudolph and Nitsen and the mission control team have also obviously been big contributors to the kind of JVM profiling space as well. So big thanks to everyone involved. Recap some of our technical and business benefits here. We want to have responsive and reliable applications. So you don't want to have your customers sitting around waiting for web pages taking ages to load. And a lot of reliability problems that annoy them can also be traced to performance problems. That results in happier users. Nowadays with the cloud, all of your infrastructure costs are metered and measured and they do add up. So cutting uh, more efficient code can cut your infrastructure costs and result in happier accountants or whoever pays the bills. And people will love the idea of scalability. And profiles can be very, very useful for helping identify and solve scalability bottlenecks within uh, software systems. So happier senior management who want to scale stuff out. A few key takeaways from profiling. Um, if you see that you're spending lots of time in user space and CPU based upon those metrics, you want to be profiling CPU time. If you find that you aren't actually using that much CPU and you want to know what your system is doing, what's it waiting on, that's when wall clock time profiling uh, comes into play. If you're looking at flame graphs, what you want to look at on the flame graph is not the big wide methods, but it's where they narrow down. That's where the self time happens and where methods split up into lots of smaller methods. Those are kind of the key points where you, you see bottlenecks and identify them within flame graphs. And finally, a uh, big tip for wall clock profiling view, you often find that um, 
the bottle, the bottom node uh, on, on flame grass for wall clock profiling can often be a read or a write. And that's a kind of uh, on a socket that can be a network operation for a foot profile input stream or output stream that can be a disk operation. Find those things and then look back up in your code and see what's going on there. If it's disk related, you need to think about how to write data or read data more efficiently. If it's network related, it's often another service or sometimes a database that is, is slowing you down there. And just whatever your, the method in your code is, that's the next thing above that tells you which one of those things it is. What I demonstrated today was a, a data driven optimization of a dominant consumer. That's a very fancy way of saying, I just looked for the biggest bottleneck with our profiling tools, fix them, iterate it. And that is a great methodology for fixing performance problems. You don't need to rewrite all your software, follow architectural buzzwords. And that's kind of the key takeaway I wanted people to have from this talk, that solving performance problems isn't a matter of saying a magical incantation or summoning a mythical beast that can uh, help you uh, do some uh, crazy smart thing. A lot of it's about sitting down, doing the hard work, measure, find the bottleneck, fix the bottleneck, repeat and iterate. And if you just keep on doing that, your code will be super fantastic compared to where it was beforehand. Um, now, uh, I've got an opportunity if anyone wants to ask any questions, as I say, I uh, co-founded and I'm CTO of Opsian. We are a low overhead continuous production profiler and monitoring tool. Our customers find this kind of code very useful, this kind of tech really useful and find it very useful to help them solve their performance problems. So if you just go to opsian.com, there's a free trial of our profiler that you can use or just talk to me about afterwards. But if anyone has any questions, I'm gonna stop the screen share now. Um, and uh, you can uh, just go ahead and ask away. Ah, I see I've got a few on the chat uh, window here. So if I just go through these on the chat window, um, Manny asks, you know, how do you measure in production or anywhere else reducing the observer effect so that's an interesting question there um manny says you know the observer effect is basically when by measuring something you change its behavior to a certain extent um i think the sense of what i'm doing that is try these tools um, no matter what that, that tool is an apm tool a profile there are all sorts of different things try it on your actual production system and see how much it modifies the timing that you have from that system and measure that overhead or change from an external system. You know, we ask customers to do that with, with Opsian. Some of them can't measure the overhead or they don't have accurate enough timing to, to even see our overhead. Um, and for, you know, for people who do measure it, it tends to be 1%, 2% lower than that in many cases. And if you're changing their performance by that lower number, it's unlikely that you're going to have uh, uh, big problems modifying what's going on. Um, we have other questions here. Uh, does Opsin work with non-JVM apps? No, we're a JVM profile, a Java JVM, but we, we support anything on the, on the JVM. Um, Manny asks, uh, Richard, are you using parallel streams? What is automatically switch to it? And those requests weren't using parallel streams. They were just using uh, regular single threaded streams inside pretty much any Java EE container type environment like that with a request. You probably don't want to be using parallel streams because uh, all of those jobs will contend on the single common fork join pool within the parallel streams framework. So you, you will often get quite bad uh, performance. Uh, looking back up, Dimitri says, Synchronize on the method, will it always have high contention? Should you synchronize um, around the assignment? So um, synchronized methods can have contention on there. 
as you saw from the profiling data afterwards and the performance improvements afterwards, actually synchronization was not a big problem with that particular method because it returned really, really fast. One way of avoiding the synchronized method call, and that was in the, de the first demo, um, not, not the second demo, the first demo, um, would have been to initialize that a final field. Because once you've initialized a final field, it's safe to read it from different threads. That's guaranteed by the Java memory model. Um, Some people are saying, oh, VM stat not installed. I mean, it's in any Linux distro repos that you can just uh, install there. And yeah, it's VM underscore stat on Mac OS. Just going back down to the bottom. Thoughts on Node.js versus Java. To be frank, I, I've written some TypeScript. It's less terrible. I'm not a big JavaScript fan in general, so I'm not <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to say I love uh, Node.js environments. Um, I think that ecosystem does tend to be a little bit immature at times with dependency issues. It's not the performance problems, I would say, that people hit. It's more the development productivity uh, um, stuff. What's the best strategy to profile applications in the microservices world? Um, as I say, I think that's what the kind of continuous profiling slide at the end showed you know we do that at Opsian. uh most of our customers are effectively running microservices environments and we can aggregate profiling data over different services so you know that's that's i don't want to be too much of a product pitch here but that's the kind of approach that we take but yeah it's basically about taking that data on different services and aggregating it and being able to see what's going on there um manny also says very specific to CPU performance. Manny, you're a real you're a real machine gun with the questions here. You keep on asking loads of them, which is fantastic, uh, fun to see. Very specific to CPU performance. Have you tried to measure apps using at contended annotation? Does this help with performance improvements? Can Opsian measure these kind of performance improvements? So that's a good question. So at contended is a sort of hidden annotation within the JDK. Um, that lets you do um, uh, padding to avoid false sharing. Now, it's difficult to see false sharing with the kind of CPU profile that Opsian offers, but um, CPU cache profiling will kind of show you sometimes when you get false sharing problems. You would still see um, a method as being slow or a bottleneck, so you'd still see it in the big picture, but it might be hard to find out that it's specifically a cache line problem. To be frank, at contended, super cool stuff, but most developers, I don't think, have bottlenecks at the level of uh, cache line contention issues, unless they're writing things like concurrent queue libraries, concurrent data structures, where you see that kind of problem. Most developers are at the sort of, we need to fix our, our more, um, simple issues than that. So I don't think it's a huge problem, but it is an interesting annotation and, and good to see in there for library developers. Uh, and final question, I think I'm going to head off after this final question because we've, we're already over eight o'clock now, over an hour. Does sampling give you a representative picture of what's happening on a system in terms of performance? And the answer is, if you're sampling what the system is doing, then yeah, definitely uh, sampling what that system is doing can be very representative. So profilers kind of come in two different forms, sampling profilers and instrumenting profilers. Instrumenting profilers, to be honest, I find have a bigger accuracy problem than modern sampling profilers. Because uh, instrumenting profilers tend to alter the relative amount of time that certain blobs of code take up in your application because the instrumentation is a fixed sized overhead and the time for different methods is different time. So it, it really fudges um, uh, the time taken for different methods in that way, whereas sampling profiles tend to be a lot better. Things like JVisual VM are not very good sampling profilers, but um, some of the more modern profilers, like I say, Opsian, for example, Async Profiler, Flight Recorder, Honest Profiler, these are more accurate sampling um, profilers. But you have to be very careful about 
what's actually measuring. I mean, the profiler within Flight Recorder itself has quite a lot of issues. It's not really measuring CPU time. It sort of picks five threads. I'm not sure if I'm getting completely right, but like picks five threads that are active within a CPU and has all sorts of weird skew issues. And I've tried profiling with Flight Recorder on certain sort of low latency consulting engagements and it's had issues there. So I'll, I'll probably pick something like Async Profiler or Honest Profiler or, or Opsian um, if, you, if you have access to a license in order to get that. But if you've got an accurate sampling profiler that's well written, it, it, it is very accurate. Um, so, okay, I think I'm gonna uh, finish the Q&A session. Um, I will get the slide deck emailed out to everyone through Dom. Thank you very much for attending. I've really enjoyed giving the talk and I hope everyone uh, enjoyed listening to it here as well. Thank you very much and Hi, have Richard. a good evening. Hi Richard, uh, this is Omar. I'm, uh, I'm hosting in place of Barry. Uh, there was one question that you probably missed out and I, because it was asked before, uh, I would give okay. the opportunity to answer that. So this was again from Mani. Uh, and the question was, have you tried all of these on Graal VMC or EE versions? And did you notice any improvements in CPU or memory or IO latency? Um, I've tried profiling with Opsin on Graal VM because we do work on Graal um, VM. I have not tested any of these benchmarks. I don't think, I, I don't know whether Graal would change the numbers particularly. Most of these things I doubt are going to be the kind of code uh, patterns that Graal is just going to optimize away magically for you. You're, you know, Graal is very smart, but it's still kind of a uh, compiler framework. So it doesn't fix your performance problems magically for you. It helps with certain things, but you still need to be um, uh, profiling at the big picture level and seeing what bottlenecks you can remove as well. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard. It was a fascinating Thanks. piece. And, uh, have a good evening. Everybody would have enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Bye.